is, as we know, is Good Friday, and it's the time when we remember the sacrifice of Christ and all that Good Friday means for us. And so this morning, the best way to think about this morning is one long communion service. So uh, we're going to come around the, the Word of the Lord, and then we're going to partake at the end in communion, celebrating, remembering, and as Paul said, proclaiming the death of Christ until he comes. Let's pray as we prepare our hearts to come around the word. Jesus, this weekend and every weekend is all about you. We stop, we pause to reflect on the gravity, the enormity and the wonder of your sacrifice. Our English words of thank you will never be enough. But we are thankful and we are grateful. And so as we reflect on all the Good Friday means for us, Holy Spirit, may you speak to our hearts, we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. If you've got your Bibles this morning, we're going to walk through a passage in Matthew 26. Uh, When I was very young, my mother uh, would give us, in liquid form, for those that are wondering, would prepare for us, like a chemist, would prepare for myself and my sister a cup of cod liver oil. (laughs) Exactly. Everyone's like, I'm feeling your pain. (laughs) Uh, The only problem with cod liver oil is you need to lick your armpit to get the taste out of your mouth afterwards. (laughs) Uh, Every single night of the week, twice every day through winter. My mother had determined that we would not be sick and get a day off school to stay home. And so we would drink cod liver oil. We were told it was good for us. We didn't believe a word of it. (laughs) Now, today, many people will say there's many health benefits to cod liver oil, and if you take cod liver oil, God bless you. Uh, But the reality is uh, myself and my sister would face those moments with great trepidation. We were made to sit at the table and drink the whole cup of cod liver oil. Uh, After you drink cod liver oil that frequently, you can eat just about anything. (laughs) But today, as we pause to reflect, I wonder whether we can bring our attention to a different cup. Today, I want to walk through a moment in time when Jesus drank a cup that wasn't his cup. This cup was no less bitter This cup was meant, in fact, for each one of us. But reflecting on this, moments like cod liver oil, and as we look at the gravity of the cross, there's a reality, if we would pull the band-aid back for a moment, there's a reality that applies to all of us in this room. And it's a reality that is not removed from the pages of Scripture, but in fact, suffering and hardship and trials and challenges are faced by mankind every single day. Uh, this theme is not removed from Scripture. It's not even removed from the pages of the New Testament. But if you dive into the Old Testament, we see that a whole book, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes, is a book dedicated to a man that struggles to find meaning in life. And so because he has the resources, he plunges himself down every well of pleasure that this world has to offer. And he comes back up and says, every one of them's empty. But then he notices something. What I appreciate about Solomon was he had the scruples to lift the lid and said, there's a reality here that we all know. There's an elephant that's in the room. We know it's there, but nobody else is talking about it. And here's what he said. Here's how he phrased it. He says, you know what? Sometimes bad things happen to good people. 
He says, you know what? Sometimes good things happen to bad people. He, he says, you know, it's what I call the Stephen Bradbury principle for those that watch the Winter Olympics, but he's, he picked up on the Bradbury principle well before they were ice skating, and here's what he says. Sometimes the race doesn't always go to the swift. Sometimes the awards and the accolades don't always go to the most learned and the most wise. There is an uncertainty that surrounds every part of our life. We are all surrounded with an element of uncertainty. We are all surrounded with an element of uh, control that we want to maintain, but we lose. We understand we can't control everything. Some of the most fittest people on the planet can sometimes be the most unwell. What we see at the cross, this elephant isn't ignored. But what God chooses to do in a moment is to step into all of that uncertainty. To be born as a vulnerable baby, to step into our uncertainty, to, to lose control like we lose control. Sometimes we're going to see what that looks like for him. And, and if you could sum the book of Ecclesiastes up with just one sentence, you would say this, we don't know what the future holds. But the writer of Ecclesiastes will say, we're able to know the one who holds the future. Hallelujah. And so he concludes his book after many ramblings and says, you know what? Fear God and keep his commandments because that's the end of the law. A man that plunged himself into every wall of this world and said there's no certainty, he says you will find it only in God, in his goodness. For those that have taken the time to read the book of Job, in just the first chapters of the book of Job, a man that lost, he knew loss, he knew pain, he, he, he knew suffering to a large extent. But what, but what he would teach us is, you know what, our outward circumstances don't change God's glory. We continue to worship. Wow. And if we step into the pages of uh, of the book of Romans, well, we're right in the midst of the greatest chapter in the book of Romans, speaking about our security in Christ. He would also highlight in verse 20 that all creation is subject to fertility. Turns out every person in this room is a part of creation. The reality and the gravity of life is there is futility, there is uncertainty, there is, there is hardship and there are challenges. But in the pages of the Gospel of John, in chapter 9, personally, I find the greatest comfort. And it's a comfort that Jesus highlights through the, through the road of the cross. In John chapter 9, Jesus is walking with his disciples and a man that was born blind is there by the side of the road and his disciples ask the question of the universe, a question that was on the lips of everybody else that was there. They just didn't have the gumption to ask the question, but they would ask the question and say, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Because everybody said that all suffering and affliction is tied directly to sin or maybe even the sin of some of your relatives. And I love Jesus' answer. While we scramble and we're always trying to find the, the cause, Jesus flips the coin and says, this isn't about cause, this is about purpose. And so Jesus says, it's neither that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. It's all about purpose. And what Jesus begins to highlight, and of course it comes to its culmination at the cross, is yes, there may be seasons of darkness, there may be seasons of suffering, but there is always an empty tomb on the other side. As we look forward to Sunday, we will celebrate and we will absolutely, uh, with great wonder, glory in the rapture of what is the resurrection. But there is no resurrection without the cross. And this morning, there's no cross without the Gethsemane. And as we look and we seek to find our place in the story of the cross, I think we find it most wonderfully, even possibly at the Garden of Gethsemane. 
For those that have turned to Matthew 26, we we see in verse 36, uh, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. But what precedes this and what I I found amazing in Matthew's account is they have the Lord's Supper, which we will partake of in a moment. and, And knowing the horrors that are about to face Jesus, they sing a hymn. In verse 30, it says, When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. How do you sing when you're on your way to meet your betrayer? After they sung a hymn, and it says, uh, when Jesus went to the place called Gethsemane, and Gethsemane uh, was a garden of olive trees, but it was where olives were harvested, it was where they were pressed, it was where they were crushed for their oil, and it's no coincidence that we find our Saviour in a garden, which we will touch on a little bit later, we find our Saviour in a garden being pressed, being crushed. Anybody else ever felt like that? Anybody else beginning to relate? You know, there are seasons in our lives there are hours in our lives when we feel like that. Amen. How glorious is Jesus that he wouldn't remain aloof from our suffering, but he says, I'm going to plunge to the very bottom of every emotion you could feel and shine a light of the way through. Then Jesus went with him to a place called Gethsemane. As we read on, he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And we must pause at those words. It's very easy to read those words and think they don't have any application here. It's very easy to read those words and think, well, he's the son of God. It wouldn't have had any effect on him, but those words are put there for a reason. And the writers of the Greek could not find another word in their language which is more intense than these two words. It speaks about an intense sorrow. It speaks about a a deep inward agitation. It speaks about enormous pain on the inside. What Jesus says is, I will go to the very bottom. I will feel the very worst. Imagine being in the shoes of Christ right now. Don Carson, a wonderful expositor of scripture, I think he sums it up beautifully when he says that the death of Christ, as well as his anguish, were unique and our response should be hushed worship. When Whenever mankind is faced with either the most glorious spectacle or the most horrific spectacle, often our first response is silence. Our breath is taken away. And so Carson says, as we begin to look at the anguish that Christ felt in the garden, our only response is hush worship. To imagine God himself dripping with all the uncertainty that we face. Being sorrowful and troubled as sometimes many of us experience. He goes on and says what I find to be a very profound verse. Verse 38, he says, Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful. This is not just the observations of those that are around him. He says, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father. What what profound words to come from the lips of Christ, if, if it is possible. What anguish would drive the son of God to utter the words, if it's possible. If it is possible, and of course the spiritual response is, well, everything's possible with God, but let's pause for a moment. From, from a moral perspective, at least, not everything is possible for God. It's, it's impossible for God to lie. It's impossible for God to sin. It's impossible for God to break his word. And it is morally impossible for God to just sweep sin and the gravity and the consequences, to just sweep it under the carpet. No, his holiness demands there must be a sacrifice. Maybe the question, yes, all things are possible with God, 
and his power is exhibited, but are all things purposeful? Nothing rests outside of God's power. If there was another way, would God not have chosen? Aristotle, who I would have considered to be an intelligent man, once said that it is impossible for man and God to be friends for one reason. He says there that mankind and God are so different that they could never be friends. And C.S. Lewis, picking up on that thought, went on in his book, uh, The Five Loves. He speaks, about, uh, he speaks about friendship. And he says the best way to describe friendship is when one person staring in the eyes of another can say, you too. And Timothy Keller would pick up very beautifully and say, only at the cross... Can mankind stand at the foot of the cross and look in the eyes of Christ and say, you too. You know our uncertainty. You feel our pain. You know sorrow. The Apostle Paul, when, if, if prior to your conversion, God says, I will show this man how much he must suffer, you better put your seatbelt on. But I feel, reading through the epistles of Paul, with all that he suffered and all that the churches that he was writing to, were, that the, all that they were facing, the horrors sometimes that they were facing uh, at that particular time, I find that Paul never praised the problem. He always praised the wonderful promises of God. He always prays how God never leaves us. God is always with us. That, that God's love would be manifested and revealed. He always prays the promises of God. He never prays the problem. Many people are attributed to this quote, but I think it applies this morning. Sometimes God calms the storm, and that's the truth here today that there are seasons and moments in our life when absolutely God stands up and speaks to the wind and the waves and they are quiet. But there are moments when he lets the storm rage and he quiets his child. As many people will know, I'm from Tasmania and I used to fish in a boat. I don't fish in a boat now because of my experience with my stepfather. But uh, when you go fishing with my stepfather, you go no matter what the weather is. Uh, for those that can remember the Sydney to Hobart race, as the fleet was coming down the coast, to meet them was coming the Coast Guard because the storm was predicted to be pretty bad. It was beginning to brew. They went past my stepfather in a 14-foot to Haviland and said, go back home. And I can remember many seasons where we would be on the other side of the lake and the storm had begin to rise and we had somebody that had never fished with us before and here's what I said to them. It's going to be a rough ride, but we'll make it to the other side. Do you know there's seasons in our lives when I, I am convinced that God says it's going to be a rough ride, but I'll get you to the other side. And there are seasons when Jesus speaks to the storm and it is quiet. And just like the disciples, all of us say, what manner of man is this? We don't have a category for this Jesus. <clears throat> Moving on, we, we come to the cup. If it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And through Old Testament pages, uh, and it, most of the references to a cup speak of God's judgment, that he would fill up a cup of judgment and that it would be poured out. But in this moment, God has prepared a completely different cup. And it's not necessarily the cup of Jesus. He will drink the cup. But uh, he says to the sons of Zebedee, he says to them prior to this event, when his mother says, can one sit on the right and the left? He turns to the sons of Zebedee and says, can you drink the cup that I will drink? He doesn't call it my cup. He just says, can you drink the cup that I will drink? Foolishly, they say, yes, we can. (laughs) 
In this moment, Jesus is drinking a cup that was not prepared for him. But what I love about this is Jesus says it's not a river and it's not a sea, but it has a bottom, it has an end. And often our cup, just like Christ will experience, how many of us would know that we don't determine the contents, we don't determine the volume. We have the choice of whether we drink. Jesus says, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And I actually think the most powerful word in this passage is nevertheless. There is power in the word nevertheless. When I arrive at the word nevertheless, I I can identify with the story because now what Jesus is saying, if there's a way, how many of us would have done the same thing? How many of us have what Jesus is confirming here? It's okay to, to pray that God would remove the cup. It's okay to ask God to calm the storms. But there is a power in the word nevertheless that says, nevertheless, oh God, your will be done The power that's in this word for me is that it defines the moment of choice. It defines the moment when Jesus says, I will surrender myself to your will. I will walk the hill of Gethsemane. Uh, I will endure the horrors of the cross. And the horrors of the cross for Jesus went far deeper than the physical. They were enough, right? Uh, The passion of the Christ was gentle on us. They would have marched our saviour up the hill naked. In the eyes of everybody, he was a criminal. He would remain silent while the soldiers placed a crown of thorns on his head, mocking his glorious dignity. He would be silent. Not a word. What I love about that word, nevertheless, is there is a moment when Jesus surrenders and he chooses. And I know for a fact that nobody took Jesus' life from him. Nobody murdered Jesus. He was I offer don't we say those words easily not my will but yours be done don't we say those easily it's a roll off the tongue they are hard words to live nevertheless what Jesus speaks throughout the Gospels of the hour. We're told that after he announces that he's the anointed one, they try to seize him and throw him off a cliff, but his hour had not yet come. Oh, we read in the Gospel of John that the chief priests had said to the temple security guards, go and get this Jesus, go and arrest him. They come back empty-handed and the, and the Pharisees say, where is he? And they say, you don't understand. Nobody's ever spoken like this man. His hour had not come. And then John chapter 12, some Greeks come to see Jesus and he says, my hour has come. And what he says in the the gospel of Luke is when they come to seize him, he says, now is your hour. Now is the moment when I will be transferred from the hands of the Almighty into your hands. You see, Jesus at this point in time, he doesn't know how long, he doesn't know how deep, he doesn't know how painful this experience will be. He doesn't know the extremities, the, uh, will this be successful? Will anybody t- believe in me? Will, will, what joy is there on the other side? Will people believe? Will they accept? Will they be saved? He doesn't know the answer to any of those questions. He gives himself over to the hands of those that would tear him up. He would, the words from the cross echo in our hearts, eh? Like, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was separated from God so that we could know union with God. He would scream from the cross, I thirst. He would become thirsty so that we could know the living water. He exchanges our pain and our suffering. Don Carson goes on and 
highlights, there's actually three gardens in the Bible. The last one's in the book of Revelation. But Don Carson highlights something beautiful about those words, not my will but yours be done. We begin in the Garden of Eden, we begin with the fall of man and he says, not your will but mine changed paradise to a desert and brought man from Eden to Gethsemane. Now, not my will but yours, brings anguish to the man who prays it, but transforms the desert into kingdom and brings man from Gethsemane to the gates of glory. But Carson's right. Those words, not my will but yours, bring anguish to the man or the woman that prays them. See, Jesus doesn't ignore the elephant in the room. Jesus doesn't say, we're we're not going to talk about the suffering subject. Jesus says, I'm going to come and I'm going to link arms with you. I'm going to step into all of your pain, your grief and your sorrow, and I'm going to show you the way through. And of course, we long for the promise of the third garden. Jesus wants to bring us to a garden which we will never leave. Jesus, the hope that lies on the other side for us is that there will be a garden that this time will not be corrupted. Nevertheless, not as my will, but yours be done. And Jesus finishes. Came to his disciples, he found them sleeping and he said to Peter, so you could not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Friends, the elephant in the room is that every one of us often have seasons and hours. We have cups. Everybody's cup is different and Jesus highlights that it's okay to pray that it would pass and to want it to pass, but Jesus also removes, reveals the fact that we sometimes must drink. I'm reminded of those wonderful Old Testament passages which highlight a wonderful truth for each one of us here today. Those wonderful passages are found in Daniel. Daniel chapter 3, where Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, three men that were facing a fiery furnace, Nebuchadnezzar said, let's make sure we do the job properly. Let's heat the furnace seven times its normal heat. And these men will stand up, no lack of faith on their part, uh, no sin that we could detect or that we're told of, but three men will stand up and declare to the king that God is able to save them from the furnace. And that is our own words, that, that God can absolutely calm the storms. God can absolutely... Uh, remove the furnace and they say but if not we will not worship you and we know the story the three men are chucked in the chucked in the furnace but when Nebuchadnezzar looks in he sees four and one like the son of man and so the promise that arrives for Daniel's friends and the promise that is us for today that sometimes even if we are plunged into the furnace God will be with us The wonderful, beautiful truth that we find with Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego is when they come out of the furnace, not one hair on their head is singed, only the ropes that bound them. Fast forward a few chapters to Daniel chapter 6 and uh, people concoct a story to get Daniel in trouble. Could God have vindicated Daniel? God could have vindicated him. God could have rescued him. But instead he's plunged into the lion's den. And he is preserved in the den. 